Ayaram Gayaram was a phrase that became popular in Indian politics after an MLA, Gaya Lal, changed his party thrice within the same day in 1967. The original text of the Indian constitution had no provision dealing with the defections of the members of the parliament or the state legislative assemblies and councils. The anti-defection law was first introduced in 1985 as a result of the 52nd Amendment Act of 1985. It was inserted in the 10th schedule of the Indian constitution and is commonly known as the Anti-Defection Act. The main intent of the law was to deter the evil of political defections by legislators motivated by the law of office or other similar considerations. As we Indians celebrate our journey of 75 years of independence, Sunset TV pays tribute to the said phenomenal journey by dedicating a series titled 75 Years Laws That Shaped India, a special program discussing different laws that have been adopted during these golden 75 years. I'm your host, Hemant Batra, back with another episode in that exclusive series. Today we are discussing the Anti-Defection Law of 1985. To talk about this revolutionary legislation, we have with us a very learned, proficient panel. We are joined by Gopal Shankar Narayanan, a senior advocate designated by the Supreme Court of India, the youngest to have been so recognized in the last 25 years. Welcome, Gopal. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. We are also joined by Professor Dr. Anupama Goel, a distinguished law professor and registrar at the National Law University, Delhi. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. So let us begin our discussion for today. And let me throw first question at you, Gopal. Yes. Gopal, as I understand, uh, you know, defection to me means uh, conscious abandonment of one's allegiance or let's say one's duty. How do you view or describe defection in simple words for our viewers? What, what constitutes defection? And also let us know what consequences follow at defection by either a House Member of Parliament or let's say Member of State Legislative Assembly or if I may put it, either House of the State Legislature. Uh, thanks for putting that question and phrasing it like that, Hemant. I look at defection as a measure of betrayal of trust that the electorate puts in the person that they are voting for. Right. So if I choose a particular candidate who belongs to a particular party and that party through that individual has appealed for my vote mm -hmm. on certain parameters, I'm expecting that person to be my representative in the house and to implement what he promised he would go forward implementing. Now, after he is elected to parliament or to the legislature and he takes his oath, if he decides to abandon that party, that plank and those promises and then cross floors for whatever personal goals of his, he is in many ways betraying the trust that I've placed in him or her to represent me and what was promised to me. Absolutely. So it is a betrayal in that fashion. Now the 10th schedule brings in a form of regulating that mm -hmm. by doing three things. One, it places a lot of premium and this is one of the criticisms of the 10th schedule on political parties. Political parties were never referred to in the constitution before the 10th schedule. Right. So it places a huge premium on the political, party. political parties. Therefore, there is no defection if an individual moves to some other individual position. Mm -hmm. But it is defection under the law when an individual who is part of a political party leaves that political party and, and joins another pa political party or an individual who was independent 
joins a political party. Right. So both of those are considered defection. Earlier, there were instances where, uh, you know, in, in the early years, till 67, as was, uh, as the introduction mentioned with the IRM, Gairam, where there wasn't much of this flow crossing, but after the 60s, it just became habitual. So they felt a need to regulate that, and that's how the 10th schedule came to be inserted, to bring that in. Right. Uh, Professor Anupama, uh, are there any exceptions or, or exemptions to, to this rule or law of anti-defection? Yeah, when we, when we legislate something, when we amend the constitution, we'll have to do it completely. Whether we are regulating something or we are just exempting something. So in the 10th schedule itself, if you see uh, paragraph 2, the beginning of paragraph 2, which is giving me what is exactly the def defection, how a person, <coughs> how a person, how a legislator can defect, in itself, the starting point is subject to paras 4 and 5. Mm -hmm. Para 4 and 5, they have exemptions to begin with. So, para 4 talks about merger. Initially, it was paras 3, 4 and 5. I see. Now, it is paras because para 3 has already been omitted by 91st Amendment Act of 2003. Now, it is amended. Uh, para 2 has also been amended. Mm -hmm. uh, it is talking about para 4 and 5 is exemptions to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, para 4 talks about mergers. Mm -hmm. If a legislator decides or a group of legislators uh, decides that they are going to form a new party by merging into another party, mm -hmm. then there has to be a minimum and it's very categorically, very emphatically written that only and if only there are two-third members mm -hmm. of that party merges into another party, that would be exempted that those members those legislators would not be disqualified on the basis of defection. So, in bulk, if somebody defects, yeah. then they are out of the purview of defection. Yes, yes. But here is the catch. Like, remainings would also be also not said to be defected. Oh. One third also, whatever is remaining of that party, So, they will also not party, be labelled as having yes, defected. They would also not be defected. And secondly, the... So, they will maintain their membership. Yes, they will maintain their membership. Uh, no sanctions as per the defection, whatever this anti-defection law says, that won't apply to them mm -hmm. in case of mergers. Mm -hmm. So, it's again a very controversial situation because mm -hmm. paragraph 3 has already been omitted, which was talking about one third of membership, mm -hmm. where split used to be there, that has been omitted and merger is still there under para 4. Mm -hmm. But because it's still there, we'll say it's an exception, it's an exemption, where part, members or the legislators, they are set, set to be not defected. So, this if is merger. This is merger. merger. And what? And paragraph 5 talks yes. about yeah. that if a person, if a legislator is uh, uh, appointed as a speaker, like presiding officer of that mm -hmm. house, mm -hmm. speaker or deputy speaker or chairperson of council of states or a chairperson or deputy chairperson of uh, council of states or uh, legislative assembly, in that case, if he abandons his, uh, leaves his party, mm -hmm. for that, that time period till he's presiding that house, mm -hmm. then that also would not be covered under defection. Right. So, paragraph 4 and 5 specifically mentioned. And then, regarding independent members and nominated members, mm -hmm. nominated members can also be exempt, exempted for uh, till 6 months. I see. 6 months, if they are going to uh, be like uh, joining any other political party, then they would be said to be defecting. Otherwise, not. No, not. So, so, so these these kinds of uh, defections. So, so this are prerequisite there. for nominated members is for six months. So six months. Beyond six months, they can defect. No, or, no. or within six months. Within, they... After six months, if he has taken oath. Yes. Then from a political party, if he has been nominated, right. he has taken oath, right. and after that, yes. he has defected. He has changed the party. Then he would be. Defect, said to be defection. defection. If okay. within six months he is de changing the party, then he won't be. Right. But for independent member, mm -hmm. if an independent member who has won the election, contested the election on an independent seat, yes. joins a political party later on after yes. he has won, after he has been elected, yes. then it would be a defection. Then it would be a defection yes. as well. Yes, yes, yes. Right. it would be a defection. Okay. So, it, it can't be exactly as an exemption, but definitely we will have to see the overall situation of defection, vis-a-vis yes. -vis independent members, nominated members, vis-a-vis -vis presiding officers and vis-a-vis right. -vis mergers and uh, right. other things. Right. Lopal, uh, 
who sits over judgment as to uh, deciding the question of defection? As far as the 10th schedule and defection is concerned, it is the speaker or the chairman, depending on Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, Assembly. But I just wanted to step back to, I think, for your viewers to understand where the 10th schedule fits in. Disqualifications exist in the constitution when you're talking about parliamentarian and legislators. Right. Article 102, several other provisions deal with it. Now, when the constitution was made, the constitution said that the president would be the decision maker based on the election commission's consultation with the president if right. and they mentioned four or five criteria there which would disqualify you from being a member or continuing as a member. Correct. If you're not a citizen of India, if you're mm -hmm. of unsound mind, mm -hmm. if you're an undischarged insolvent. Mm -hmm. So some of these criteria were laid down. It also said there could be a law made by parliament mm -hmm. which could decide other disqualifications. I see. So in 1950 and 51, we had the two representation of people acts, the two legislations. The 50 act is less relevant for this purpose. The 51 act dealt with many, many things which regulate elections. In which sections 8 to section 11 of the representation of people act lay down disqualifications there. With reference to those who have been convicted for offences. Yes, correct. So they stand disqualified automatically no decision has to be taken to apart be taken from the regard. judgment of the court Correct. which has convicted them Correct. and based on the sentencing the disqualification will kick in right. from when that sentence is to operate so that and certain other disqualification for corrupt practices yes, in absolutely. elections etc yes. there some of those the decisions there if it's not automatic based on the of the uh, uh, the, the judgment of the court then over there, the election commission will take a decision. Right. So you have these three clear brackets. One, right. under the constitution itself, yes. where the decision is by the, the president yes. and the election. Then under the Representative People Act, yes. where the decision is based on operation of law, where judgment coming in, or sometimes the election commission steps in. And this is the third situation where under the anti-defection law, it's the speaker. Speak. Okay. So this, this last part has come in for quite a bit of criticism over the last many years. Because we have a series of situations where, uh, like ma'am was mentioning, you expect the speaker, and that's why the exemption in para 5, yes. you expect the speaker, the chairman, to behave as if they are not attached to any party, any party. and they're absolutely neutral. Because, yeah, they, they're judges in that sense. Yes, yes. but the truth is they're not. Yeah. In uh, practicality, they, they have their them. allegiance. Absolutely. Right? So when a decision has to be made, if a few members decide to cross flows right. and defect, if they are going from the speaker's party to across the floor, the speaker will be very quick to decide that they are disqualified. Correct. Correct. But if it's the other way around and they are joining the speaker's party, yes. then he will be lackadaisical and spend years, months. Right. So a series of cases have come to court right. based on that. Right. Well, it is time to slip into a very short break. Please don't go anywhere as we are coming back shortly. Welcome back after the break. You're watching our special show on selective landmark laws legislated during our journey of 75 years of independence. Today we are discussing a significant law, the anti-defection law. Despite the anti-defection legal regime in place, the political dispensations in the past have found ways to topple governments. This includes reducing the total membership through resignations. The constitution was amended to ensure that any person disqualified for defecting cannot get a ministerial position unless, unless they are re-elected. The way around this has been to resign rather than vote against the party. There have also been delays, as Gopal was mentioning, in taking decisions on the disqualification of a member or members. We will discuss all this and more 
but after glancing through the parliamentary journey of this law. The Constitution 52nd Amendment Bill was introduced on 24th January 1985 in the Lok Sabha. The said bill was debated and passed in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha on 30th January 1985 and 31st January 1985 respectively. The bill then received the assent of the President of India on 15th February 1985 and came into effect on that same date. Let us view and hear some of the significant debates in the Parliament on the said Act. The defection is a curse. During the period 1967 to 1973, at least 1,832 members crossed the floor and 144 out of them became ministers. This law will put an end to horse trading in politics and the dubious means of becoming ministers. We are seeking to disqualify persons who disobey the mandate of the party, either by voting contrary to the mandate of the party or by abstaining from voting contrary to the mandate. The political parties should be able to come together periodically, deliberate over this issue and arrive at some consensus and evolve a code of conduct among themselves so that they establish healthy norms and standards for their parties. Uh, Gopal, I was uh, reading para 7 of the anti defection law, which says that uh, you know, no court shall have any jurisdiction with regard to the decisions which are taken as to uh, disqualification or, or, or perhaps defection. Yes. Uh, is the decision of the presiding officer uh, judicially reviewable? In fact, uh, the, the constitution uh, <clears throat> can be amended. For a, for a number of reasons. And the famous Keshav Nanda Bharti case in 1973 laid down that the basic structure of the constitution cannot in any way be altered. One of the basic principles in the basic structure is the judicial review mm -hmm. of any action. Mm -hmm. What this para 7 in the 10th schedule does is the same thing that the Indira Gandhi amendments regarding our elections did, which is to exclude judicial review of her yes. election, exclude judicial review. Now, uh, in that case, in 1975, the Supreme Court said you can't exclude judicial review. review. They repeated that in a whole bunch of cases with reference to administrative tribunals and Chandra Kumar, they again said you can't exclude judicial review. This 10th schedule was challenged first in Punjab and by Prakash Singh Badal, who was the former cha uh, chief minister of Punjab. I and see. in 1987, the Punjab and Haryana High Court struck down this paragraph saying that it excluded judicial review, it's a violation of the basic structure. I see. It came to the Supreme Court again uh, in Kehoto Holhan's case in 92-93 and there the Supreme Court followed what Prakash Singh Badal had reasoned, that judgment had reasoned and said that you can't exclude judicial review. I see. But the Supreme Court didn't pitch it on judicial review being part of the basic structure. The yeah. Supreme Court went by a procedural anomaly. Under yeah. Article 368, when you amend the Constitution, Parliament is exercising a constituent power, not the Parliament's power of mm -hmm. making laws. Mm -hmm. So when you're exercising the constituent power and the amendment is having an impact mm -hmm. on any parts of the Constitution which have a federal flavor to it, which includes the powers of the courts, mm -hmm. you have to have the consent of half the legislatures of the states. That this amendment failed to do. Oh. So 368 to proviso provides for that. Correct. So the constitution bench in Kehoto Holohan said that you have not followed this. Therefore, and because article 136, which provides for special leave petitions, article 226, which provides for writ petitions, article 32, those are all the judicial powers. Since you haven't got that consent, this amendment is bad. So, it made it very clear that judicial review is possible. So, para 7, even though you'll find it in the printed text of the constitution, right. doesn't exist doesn't because exist it's been struck Because down. of the judgment of the Supreme Court. And subsequently, in 2012, the Supreme Court in Sudhakar was a Jeev Raju, said that the decision of the speaker is a quasi-judicial decision and it's subject to judicial, judicial review. review. So, you can always challenge the decisions of the speakers. Right. Very well said. Uh, <laughs> Professor Anupama, uh, there are several 
schools of thought and opinions with regard to efficacy, efficiency and effectiveness of this, this law of anti-defection. Uh, how can one make this law more effective uh, or, or is it good in the present form? What is your take on that? See, for that, we'll have to see what was the basic objective and purpose uh, behind this uh, schedule. Why, why did we incorporate this schedule in 1985? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, after 1960s, as Mr. Gopal has al already pointed out, and your video has also shown, Ayaram Gyaram. Mm -hmm. Gyaram incident is a 1967 incident. Mm -hmm. Like when Gyalal, who was a member of uh, Haryana State Legislative Assembly, he, in 15 days, crossed the floor thrice. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, Indian National Congress uh, Party's member. Mm -hmm. He went to Janta Party. Within like 10-15 uh, days, uh, 10 days he came back. And then he came back. Uh, then he went back to uh, Congress Party. And after 1967, it became a trend. Like, you cross floor mm -hmm. for whatever way you feel like. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want, whatever incentive, whatever consideration is yours. Nobody is going to ask you. Mm -hmm. So change floor, cross mm -hmm. the floor. And you be there as a minister or as a member of any party which is giving mm -hmm. you the best. Correct. So, there are so many amendment bills which came after this mm -hmm. in 67 and then 32, 32nd amendment bill, 48th amendment bill. Mm -hmm. And then there, there was ultimately this amendment 52nd, 52nd which Correct. got passed. Correct. So, this came into being but again like how much effective it is because there are slight 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 loopholes in the drafting of this uh, schedule yeah. as well as how this is going to be interpreted like para 7 we have uh, like segregated so we have severed doctrine right. of severability has been applied right and this is not non-existent now no it's a total schedule minus paras 3 and 7 you can right. say because split has al already been omitted Correct. So, we'll have to see how effective even the, it is. Even the one-third bar was raised to two-thirds yes. by 91st yes, uh, yes. amendment, constitution amendment, yes. So, there are so many amendments have been done because yes. there were many committees in between. Because of all these crossing floor continued in one way or the other. Correct. So, Dinesh, uh, Swami, Dinesh Goswami committee was there. Then there was a Law Commission of India report 170th talking about electoral reforms. Then there was National uh, Commission on Review of Working of the mm -hmm. Constitution 2002. Mm -hmm. So, in all, all these, they have recommended so many things mm -hmm. to make this law, make this mm -hmm. schedule more effective. Mm -hmm. So, this is one, they, they recommended split, uh, split should be abolished. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they said that uh, why, why so many ministers are required in one government? Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you have a jumbo cabinet, Mm -hmm. It will be a kind of a burden, a kind of a brunt on the yeah, burden public on the treasury, and, treasury plus and the uh, a lot of scope for accommodating defectors. Yeah. Reward these guys. Yeah, reward, reward these, these guys. Make the yeah. minister. Yes, yes. Yeah. So they recommend it. Uh, the total recommendations I'm just clubbing because of shortage of time. Right. Main recommendations were a split should not be allowed. Second right. is the, the such kind of um, jumbo ministries, cabinet ministries can't be allowed. You Correct. fix, they said 10%, 15% of the total number of the strength of the house, house. that should be the ministership. Yes. Otherwise, you can't go on and on. And that was just, very progressive, yeah. I, I feel, provision. So, so, Article 75, 164, they were amended. Mm -hmm. There was 1A, 1B was a, were added to both these articles. Mm -hmm. And then also they said, if a person has defected and he has been disqualified under 102 Clause 2, then... He can't, he can't be a member of that house. Mm -hmm. One is you defected, you disqualified because of defection. Mm -hmm. You can't continue to be a member of that house un 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 unless and until you get elected again. Correct. So you can't be there as a member of that house. Mm -hmm. And so th uh, third thing, the most important was 361B. Mm -hmm. You can't hold public office remunerative post, mm -hmm. which is getting money from the government. Any mm -hmm. incorporated body or government mm -hmm. may not be compensatory, but if you are getting money from the government, mm -hmm. then also you can't hold that post. So, in a way, all these amendments uh, have already been done, but mm -hmm. few more contentious points which are remaining, mm -hmm. that whether speaker, the presiding officer of the house should continue mm -hmm. to be the adjudicator in defection cases mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very difficult area. Mm -hmm. And recently also in Manipur assembly case, mm -hmm. Justice Nariman has pointed out, Mm -hmm. that it should be reviewed, it should be done away with 
either there should be some independent panel or a tribunal, uh, or, tribunal something. or something should Correct. be there. Correct. And in light of one, one, one or three, mm -hmm. we can do it very simply. We can Correct. do it as uh, Mr. Gopal has already pointed out. Mm -hmm. 1021 is covered under 103. Mm -hmm. But why not 1022, which mm -hmm. is defection? Correct. Why can't it be only done by a president or the governor? Mm -hmm. Under the opinion of election commission, Already there of is India. a mechanism in yeah. under the constitution. Or there is Gopal a mechanism. Was. Yeah. Well, it is time to take the viewers' question now. The question is from J B Singh from Delhi. Let us listen in. Does anti-defection law curtail the right of freedom of speech of legislature? Uh, Gopal, uh, the the question is: uh, Does uh, anti-defection law curtail the right of free speech of legislators? Well, that's a very interesting question. It's come up for discussion many, many times and continues to be debated now. The fact that legislators are supposed to have the widest and freest exchange of ideas so that the normal rules that apply to the rest of us doesn't apply to them in the House because they are making laws therefore. So you can be as extreme as necessary to actually uh, bring that out. And... Uh, I, I don't believe that there is any unreasonable restriction as far as their speech mm -hmm. is concerned. In fact, the Supreme Court took note of this, this in the Kyoto judgment, I see. Uh, which is the main judgment dealing with defections. And they struck a balance. Now, I'll tell you the strange thing is, and this is something we had moved the Delhi High Court some time ago, and they said we are not entertaining it unless a member of parliament moves us. Uh -huh. we, this is a PIL. Uh, is that Kyoto actually has a passage which says, that while the two triggers for defection in the 10th schedule mm -hmm. are one that you have voluntarily left the party or shown that you have left the party which later in Ravi Nayak's case the Supreme Court has said it doesn't require you to expressly do it it can be implied by your actions that right. you have left the party and the second is where you in some way uh, violate the whip that has been given to you on how to vote in yes. parliament. Now, the big argument made against this was, well, you're then making this ch person who is supposed to be a representation a representative of his constituency a hmm. uh, uh, instrument of the party, hmm. which is not the idea in democracy. Absolutely. By telling him that, look, that's the whip, you have to go by it. So, the Supreme Court struck a balance by saying, we believe hmm. that these two conditions should be limited, as far as the free speech angle is concerned, only to two situations. One, where it is a confidence or a no confidence mm -hmm. motion where you, which your party relies on there you Very shouldn't important. you yes. shouldn't defy the whip the second is that it's a promise on the basis of which you had gone to the electorate to get the vote basically oh. part of your manifesto you had gone on that correct on those two things okay. if you violate the whip you will be oh. guilty of defection but on everything else, you are free to vote. You are free to vote wherever you want. Yeah, to. so which is, said, which is very vital. Which is very important. Very and important. In fact, very when, significant point. When, when you ask what are the suggestions that should come, that should get engrafted in the constitution by an amendment, I believe. Excellent. And that that's that's important. So if I am forced to vote mm -hmm. on a matter which affects only my constituency, right? Uh, but there's a party whip which says vote against your constituency, how can I do that? Uh, yeah, There is such a conflict. Yeah, it's absolutely right? So obviously I should have the freedom to go ahead and the constitution and the law as it stands today gives me that freedom. So Correct. I think that there, therefore there is a balance and I, I don't think freedom of speech is therefore curtailed beyond what is reasonable. Very well explained. Well, even though the law has had some challenges, it has certainly attained the best possible results in the given circumstances. With that note, let me thank our guests, Gopal Shankar Narayanan thank and you, Professor Anupama Goel for sharing uh, your expert views with the viewers, with all of us, and enlightening us as well about this anti-defection law. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, that's all we have in this edition of the program. You can also connect with us on various other social media platforms. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and Namaskar.